All right, it says go. So I guess we could go it now. <laughs> it's really aggressive. Go. <laughs> it's really aggressive. That's a demand. I will not be bullied. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I'm not ready to go. I'm ready. That's right. I'll go when I'm ready. Uh, anyway, welcome back, everybody. We're here for oh, Fire and Ice. Here we are. This is the fifth one of these we did. I'm just going to keep going with ridiculous, stupid. <laughs> it's humor. It's humor and recovery right, right here as we call ourselves Fire and Ice for no apparent reason except for oh, that you have a history of playing no hockey reason. and I live in California. That's it. So. It is such a stretch and it's ridiculous. It's absurd to the point of ridiculous and like almost cringy. So I like yeah. it. I like it. It's yeah. good. Who are these yeah. fire and ice? What's with them? What are they? An <laughs> 80s disco act? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope this is where oh, I want to be. Is an 80s. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, anyway, for those who do not know who fire and ice, <laughs> Lauren Rosen, LMFT, therapist in California and a friend of mine. We do these on a re pretty regular basis. We talk about anxiety and anxiety recovery and different topics that you guys want us to cover. So, welcome back, Lauren. Welcome back. And if you're joining from, from my platform, that's Drew Lincelotta right there. He's okay. great. The Anxious Truth. He's got a podcast. He's got books. He's got an Instagram platform. He's got it all. <laughs> I don't know when this turned into a oh, you God. commercial. Oh, no, when exactly right. When did it turn into a commercial with Drew? I like it, though, because well, you deserve always, a commercial. Oh, thank you. Well, we're always joking around. So which brings us to our, our topic today, which is humor. Where does humor fit in in the whole anxiety disorder and recovery complex? Yeah. Well, we're both kind of jokesters. We spend a lot of time just cracking ridiculous comments to each other. So clearly, well, because life gets way too serious and sad if you don't if you don't bring okay. a little humor into it, right? Yeah. So where do we think it fits in? I I'm going to put all the pressure on you, just like when the cool. thing said go. It says go, go, Lauren, go, go, dance monkey. Talk. Uh, do. Um, so I, uh, one of the things that pops into mind immediately is especially with exposure work, because it's all so doom and gloom <laughs> and this horrible thing could happen to you because that's sort of the radio doom and gloom that's playing in your head all the time that sometimes we forget that optimism is actually an exposure in a way. That's good. And it's not something I, and my therapist shared that with me. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> actually really good. I never would have thought of that. Optimism <laughs> is exposure. Okay. okay. Because I, expecting that good things will happen is yep. scary. Yeah. Cause there's no protection in that. I'm not mm -hmm. guarding against the bad. If I'm just allowing good things or I'm expecting good things. It's not okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So having this levity, this playfulness, this, yeah, maybe the bad thing does happen and, and treating it lightly in and of itself is I think an, an adjunct, a support to exposure work rather than keeping it always in this, the, the dark things possibly going to happen. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe. Maybe that happens and maybe the good thing happens. I really don't know. Okay. I guess it's yeah. not really humor per se, but it's connected in a roundabout kind of a way. Yeah. I mean, at least it tends away from the dark clouds, you know, for sure. Mm -hmm. If you're going to let some optimism in, I think like the humor for me, I know in my own personal humor is a lot easier to come by after the fact. I don't know if you found the same thing, <laughs> like in the heat of the moment, there was no, nothing was funny. I mean, there's yeah. nothing was funny when, you know, when you're actually racked with it, but sometimes it was funny the next day, like in the, you know, when rationality got a chance to come back, it was a little bit funny down the road. Now, the things that I did to me just cracked me the hell up. I can't even imagine there's no logic behind it, but I did them anyway. Yeah. Um, but even at the time, the one that I, and I tell the story often, so I'm sure you guys, some of you guys have heard this, but I had this irrational fear that the, the, any new food in the fridge had been tampered with. So mm. I, Hey, I would sure love some orange juice, but that's a brand new carton of orange juice and clearly it's been poisoned. So naturally. I would just, yeah, no natural. So what would you do about that? You would, you throw it away and, and make sure that nobody gets poisoned? No, I'll just let somebody else in the house drink it first. And, <laughs> right. So now that is hilarious. At the moment, the it was like, <laughs> what kind of a monster am I? Like these thoughts would be in my head. Mm. But then the next day, if I wasn't feeling it, I would see the humor in that. Like that is patently absurd. And the fact that I would let someone else <laughs> drink it first 
was just like, really? Like I had to just roll my eyes at the absurdity of it. And there was a little bit of funniness in that. Absolutely. Well, yeah. And allowing some of that did help me, I think. Yeah, for sure. And I think over time, it gets closer to the moment of extreme anxiety when you can access this humor. So I was, for instance, I can't even remember what it was about, but it was probably six months ago and I, I noticed an anxiety spike and I have a pretty solid mindfulness practice. And so I noticed that my anxiety was starting to rev up and I texted my friend. I was like, wow, my anxiety, it's like, it's spectacular right now. It's like a 4th of July fireworks show. I mean, wow, <laughs> like just off the charts, you know? And it did, it made me laugh while I was anxious. I got to have both of those experiences at the same time. I like time. that. So the further down the road you get in your progress, the closer the humor can get to the actual distress. So the humor and the stress sort of mix, they could coexist. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. It's a good indicator think... of where you are. No, I, I don't disagree. Because only the objective view of what's going on or, or a more objective view allows you to see the humor in it. When yes. you're entirely mired in the subjective and the judgment, and this is horrible and bad things are going to happen, there's no humor. But right. when you can see it for what it really is, it does get a little funny. There's a little bit more playfulness. And I, I think also as you back off of the all or none thinking and the sense that life can only be good if it is without anxiety, mm -hmm. as you get a little further from that and recognize that, no, the whole point is to live a life that's full and anxious, that there's a, there's more capacity to hold both simultaneously. Things can be funny and anxious or funny and terrifying and funny and sad all at once. So yeah. there's a, a degree of like the psychological flexibility that is reflected in being ready to laugh at even when things, yeah. yeah. Being able to do that, I think in the moment, I, yeah. I know one thing that I've heard, and to me, this is brilliant. I never thought of this, but I've heard some people tell me that you know, when you had the repeated experience of I'm in a crisis, I'm in a crisis, nothing happened. I'm in a crisis, I'm in a crisis, oh, nothing happened. But once you have that experience enough, I've heard people who are able to say, I can almost look at it as future me, like tomorrow mm -hmm. me, when this has passed, I can almost see what tomorrow me will see. And then they could start to almost make fun of it as a, yeah. as a diffusion tool, not yes. a use, but a defusion tool. Yes, so an acceptance uh, and commitment therapy, kind of defusion, DE. -E. Yes, pretty much. Yeah. Like, okay, I can think about what I'm going to, I can imagine what I'm going to think about this episode tomorrow when I'm, I know that nothing happened and now I can almost laugh at what I'm afraid of. Yes. Yeah, if, I think yeah. there's an important caveat to that, which is if you don't take action based on, so the second that you start to do a safety behavior or the, or a compulsion, your mind is then going to attribute your safety after the fact to the behavior. Uh, that, and okay. so if you do that, then you don't get the learning, right? The learning that, oh, I guess I was okay. I was able to tolerate the, the feelings. Mm -hmm. They ultimately passed. Uh, it seems like the bad thing hasn't happened yet. So I guess, I don't know. It's, it seems like I don't need to do that thing in order to survive. And I think at that point, you can then project in the future go, oh yeah, I've, I've, I know I've done this before and mm -hmm. it's in the moment terrifying. And if I accept this terror, it it's you know probably going to benefit me overall based on my experience. Yeah. So does the, that make the sense? Word, yeah, it does make sense. I see where you're getting at. So the concern there would be that the, the attempt to inject humor can become its own, like a tool, a compulsive tool or a safety behavior. Right. Like, oh, I have to make jokes to knock this down to be okay. Yeah. And just that you never get to the place of recognizing the, or having that space from, from the anxiety, if you're not able to stop doing the compulsions, just okay. independent of the humor, you're not yep. going to understand that, that, uh, space between, oh, right. I've been through this before and I know what this is like. And if I don't do anything, it's scary. And I'm likely to have more objectivity in the future. And then you can be like, right. Okay. Well, tomorrow me is probably in, in my, my reserves. I know that tomorrow me has a little bit more objectivity and then can inject the sort of humor into it a little bit that more easily. Sense. However, I think your point is really well taken. And we were kind of touching on that before the episode. So I'm going to, 
I'm now put it on you in a go aggressive kind of a way. Yeah. Talk to us yeah. about how, how humor can become a compulsion or a safety behavior, Drew. I think it could become a bit of a safety behavior. Well, it can become a couple of different things. It could be the best disguise ever for what I like to call covert reassurance seeking. You know, mm -hmm. now I always like to say like assurance is okay. We're allowed to learn and we're allowed to ask questions. That's okay. Not everything is, is bad reassurance, but when you've already heard the answer 16 times and you want the 19th, that's where the problem is. But so humor often gets used as a, a gloss or cloak around that reassurance seeking. So I'm going to make a funny joke. I, I see no humor in the way I'm feeling right now, but I will make a joke to you, my friend. Hey, Lauren, let me tell you this funny thing about what my body's doing right now. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh. I did this in a meeting the other day, actually. I did. I like, I'm just going to straight up call myself out. Uh, Sorry, I feel like I, I interrupted hey. your- Oh, your... no, no. This is exactly what we're talking about. Bring it. So I, I was talking with a colleague and I said something that I realized in the aftermath could have been interpreted as somehow unkind or, or uh, insensitive or, or as a, a criticism of her. And I found myself- sort of reading her facial expressions and trying to determine, right? Compulsively as we do. Okay. Uh, sometimes from time to time. Oh, what is she thinking? As if I could actually determine that. <laughs> but right. I I found myself at a certain point going, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm I'm gonna do my best to accept uncertainty right now that so and so is not upset with me. And it was in a, so it was in a joking manner completely. And then she laughed and I was like, see, I'm good. <laughs> That's yeah, see? I'm going to make a joke to get what I want. Mm -hmm. So yes, when you're in that scary situation and you're feeling like, Oh, I want to ask somebody about this, or I, I need to be told it's okay, but you know, you're not supposed to making a joke about it. Huh? My, my stupid heart is doing flips again, huh? LOL. Like I see it in my face all the time. People, someone, I'm like, I'm not picking on people. I did it too. We all do it. But yeah. they'll roll in and they'll just make a statement. Yeah. Having a lot of, you know, uh, palpitations, you know, hate those. Stupid heart, LOL. Okay, yeah. well, what, what yeah. were you after? So to me, humor can become safety behavior in that form. Like I'm going to cloak my reassurance seeking in a joke. And can I, I mean, look, I don't know how old everybody is watching, but I was doing this when Reagan was president. So my anxiety is calling out your anxiety on this bullshit. I did all of those <laughs> things. Well, I know, I know exactly why, because I did all of them. I was doing them before a lot of you guys were born, sadly, but like, okay, that that's a thing. That's part of how humor can become a safety behavior. Yeah. In, in one way. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. That, yeah. Yeah. Also that, or sometimes it becomes a frustrating attempt at a safety behavior that doesn't work. Like, oh, I'm just going to start cracking jokes and huh, try and make myself laugh, which we know we can't do, can't yeah. demand to feel something that is funny. So I've seen people get really frustrated when humor is their default coping mechanism and it doesn't work in, yeah. in the face of this thing. Yeah. Sometimes they get a little like discouraged. I'm like, oh, it's not working. Yeah. 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 That's, well, and that's the thing. Well, and it's an indicator that you're using it compulsively because if if you find yourself trying to do something and then it re-triggers you, right? like if you're trying to get that, which compulsion safety behavior, behavior so often do re-trigger us, yeah. which is one of the major issues with them, frankly. I mean, you're going to make it worse potentially. Um, but I, I think the other thing that we were talking about before we started is that sometimes you can try to laugh off your anxiety as a, a means of discrediting it. Being yes. like, <laughs> yeah, I'm so sure that that, you know, that doorknob has germs on it. Good point brain. Right. Which look, I don't even think that that's inherently a bad way to react. I think if you have a balance in your recovery practice of, of recognizing that I do at, at the bottom of it have to accept the uncertainty, that that's, it's not a problem. However, if that's your main go-to and you're trying to use it to convince yourself that your anxiety is full of it and that the bad thing isn't going to happen, we've lost the thread, I think. 
I think so too. And that's the difference between you don't use it as a convincing or a reassurance. Like, again, I hate to keep using the word reassurance, but when you're unsure, trying to use hum, uh, humor to knock down that discomfort probably isn't a good move. But as that, again, that diffusion tool, like, oh, yeah. I'm terrified right now because I'm pretty sure this doorknob is contaminated, but I know crazy brain you, I know you're trying to suck me in and yeah. I, I'm calling you out and I'm not going to engage with that, but I am yeah. terrified. I uh, yeah, exactly. I am scared, but okay. I'm going to call you out for being like a, jer a jerk brain, you know, right. stop doing that. okay. And being it. playful with it in, in yeah. the service of that. And maybe talking about the humor part, this is where it's funny that you brought up diffusion earlier because diffusion techniques, I think can be really great for this. And like singing a little song, like while you're terrified, right? So totally accepting that your the fear is pumping through your veins. It's like, I am going to touch this doorknob and it is going to give me a disease, right? Like the, at least you know, like and you're dancing to you're it. You're turning into an 80s disco act little by little. I go. forgot. See, it's happening. <laughs> it's happening. So, you know, but the, there's, there's at least like, okay, well, because we're riding this feeling and at least I might as well just yeah, try and play while I'm at it. Cause otherwise it's just going to be miserable. In that respect, especially in your specialty, where you're trying to take the bite out of those thoughts and yeah. those obsessions, you would think that being able to do that in a, at least an attempt at a humorous way has to start to try to take the bite out of that. I'm going to sing a song about my contamination. And it often does. I think it's all down to your, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Your intention. Yeah. And if you're that's, intending it to talk yourself out of it, then that's a problem. But if, if you're intending it to just recognize that the thoughts happening and that you're uncertain and, and trying to ride the wave with a little bit of yeah, laughter. Yeah. Yeah. I get yeah. that. It's yeah. such a fine line. So much of this is the mm -hmm. fine line between what's useful and what's not. And what's useful on Tuesday might be counterproductive on Wednesday, but then useful mm -hmm. again on Thursday. So it's, you have to be contextually aware and sometimes we make mistakes and that's okay. We'll blow it yeah. sometimes. But yeah. I think another that's cool funny. thing about humor and recovery is it does foster that sense. Look, nobody wants to feel alone. And I mean, God knows instant therapy is all about making sure you're not alone. We know this. So yes. yeah, like you're not alone. We get it. There's millions of us. We get it. But ever, nobody wants to feel like they're the only one. And humor is a good common thread. So yeah. when I tell the silly orange juice story, people crack up, but they also, oh my God, I thought I was the only one that did that. And then people yeah. can come together and understand like, okay, I'm not, I'm not really broken. So that's always nice. I yes. Mean, we also see that pop up around, you know, what about Bob? One of my favorite movies. Yes. <laughs> Anybody watching this right now loves what about Bob? I got to find oh, a wow. way to get permission to stream that to like everybody one day. We'll all watch together. I know. We should, That's that would be, I would be in for that. And uh, like oh, a real time watch session of what about I don't know Bob? who owns it, but maybe I, I'll make a note about that. Maybe I'll reach out. It's an educational thing. We have a community full of people dealing with anxiety disorders that love what about, but what about Bob? Can we stream it once? Totally. Maybe they'll yeah. give us the, okay, we'll see. But I, that humor could be a really bonding tool, a tool that lets people yes. bond and understand they're part of a community and they're not alone and other people actually share their struggles. So that's a good thing about humor. I think if you can indulge in it a little bit. Absolutely. I think that. I've found that humor is easier to access when you've got other people that you're connected to who understand, right? Like that that's sometimes it's easier if you're talking to a friend to have a laugh than it is if you're just sitting alone in the experience. And I'm not talking about as a, a tool to reassure yourself excessively, but as a, you know, as, as just a, it's the common humanity piece, right? There's so much comfort in just, to your point, knowing that you're not alone and this is, you're not the only person to ever experience this thing. And maybe sharing the experience in a humorous way is certainly a lot more accessible, maybe safer, less threatening than, I mean, look, we're talking about, you know, I, I went to the ER again for the 16th time in the year. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. Mm. But if I can talk about it with the community humorously, it makes, it's a softens the blow a little bit. Like I'm yeah. wrapped by thoughts of harming my, my children. Nobody wants to talk about that. That's a terrible topic, but if there's some humor possibly woven in, it becomes a softer conversation, yes. maybe. So. Actually, it's so funny. Uh, and I don't know if this was his content or somebody else's, but I saw a post uh, from Anxiety Josh uh, just today. Oh, that yeah, that guy, that guy, well, your buddy. <laughs> um, so he was saying something 
about, you know, those, the CAPTCHAs, the, the things that you have to do to prove you're not a robot. That's and it's so good because he, he basically, somebody <laughs> said, do you overthink things, right? So the meme is, do you overthink things? Me. And there's a picture of one of the CAPTCHAs. And is there, is there a streetlight in this, in this square? <laughs> it's like this much of the streetlight. This much <laughs> And anyone who's anxious has been there, right? Like we, oh, oh yeah. gosh, is that at the, what if, you know, it's, it's perfect. So having the ability to laugh and to see, oh, wow. Yeah. I really do take things to an extreme. I think it just supports mindfulness. Ultimately the ability to really witness it without judgment. Um, and, and with a, a heaping dose of, of self-compassion for sure. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I'm sure you get this too. I, I know because the content you put out is outstanding. How many times has somebody replied in your comment section, I feel personally attacked by this? Make <laughs> yes. so, and that's how you know, for somebody like, like Lauren, for somebody like me, when you say, I feel personally attacked, or get out of my head, you're freaking me out. Okay, we, know, we know we did it right. So yes, totally. It really becomes a great thing. People can express that, that way. Truly. I also like when you, one of the things that I like is using humor in exposure. So if there's a content area that is anxiety provoking to you and there's some sort of a stand up special about it that tends to bring up your anxiety, that's a great exposure because there you are having both of those experiences simultaneously. At the same time. So do you think though, because I have had people who try to use specifically stand up sometimes or funny movies, like, oh, if I'm really anxious, I'll put a funny movie on, but they're trying to force themselves into that jovial kind of thing with the movie. And mm -hmm. that doesn't work out so well, but you're using it as an actual exposure tool. Though. Yeah. Not like make it go away. Like, no, 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 no. Let's listen to this guy tell jokes about this for 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to think, cause I did not watch it and I can't remember who special it was, but somebody recently did a stand up comedy special that talked about Michael Jackson right, and the, the sort of allegations of, of oh, yeah. child abuse yeah. Yeah. and who, yeah. Do you know who it was? I can't remember. No, but I'm sure it's been talked about often by comedians, but I could see where that would be a real triggering thing. Oh, very true. Like I had, I had clients come to me and say, this is really triggering. And so we ended up turning it around and be like, okay, well, let's, let's watch, watch it. it. <laughs> this is great. Um, and I, I do think it's not, I think that if you're trying to, to cultivate anxiety in order to, or cultivate anxiety, cultivate laughter, uh, in order to mask anxiety and try in order to try and like push that out. That's a problem. If mm -hmm. you're saying, okay, I'm feeling anxious. I'd also like to cultivate this other experience to have while I'm feeling anxious. That's mm -hmm. great because you're under no obligation to, you know, exclusively feel anxious for the duration of your anxiety. In fact, quite the contrary, that's probably going to keep you stuck. Yeah, true. That's that even if thing, even if I am anxious, I can watch this. I can read yeah. this book. I can have this conversation even if, even while. Um, yeah. That's a good idea. I never really thought about that using stand up or, or, or movies or anything like that that has that subject. But I've seen people do that in my community for sure. Like, oh, I'm really triggered by such and such. I'm watching reruns of ER. Yeah. People tell things like, we'll go and watch, you know, hospital medical dramas and stuff. And it's really hard for them, but they do it and it helps them. So, yeah. Why wouldn't a stand up special? That makes good sense. Yeah. yeah I dig it. It's a good way to shake it up. Let's wrap it up with, a, I think, an important thing because we know that this is a big issue for so many people in recovery that they come into the process full of negative self belief and self doubt and a, and a poor self image and, and a lot of, you know, harsh judgment about themselves. When does humor become, we can all laugh at like, oh, I can't even believe I was afraid of that. You know, mm -hmm. and I'll laugh at my orange juice thing. I can't believe that I was actually afraid of, blah, blah, blah. Um, I was on a, I was on someone else's podcast, Jen Kirkman's podcast, and she is the, I was jumping up and down. She's the second person ever said this to me. She had the fear, and she talks about this openly. It's in her podcast. She was afraid that gravity would stop working. That was her obsession. Mm. Oh, wow. Right? Like, yeah. how terrifying is that? She was, the, that's the second human being I've ever heard with that particular fear. And yeah. so we got to talking about it, but she laughs about it now. Yeah. At the time, not so much. When does that go into self deprecating and, and really harsh self-judgment because so I've seen that the humor almost gets too far. Yeah. You know, I, I can laugh at the fear, but now I'm actually laughing at myself and there's a difference. Yeah. That's such a good question. I don't know that I have an answer for it. I don't I know think... if it really is an answer more than an observation. Probably. 
Yeah, no, but it's so important. I think maybe the answer to some ex extent is in that making sure that the self-compassion is there, that it's not, it's that it, it's in the intent again, it's in the flavor of it. And if you're using it as a, a whip to lash yourself versus if, if you're recognizing like, wow, life is funny. I, I think the the thing is one of the the beautiful things about humor is that it's all about I don't know, taking the whole experience that we're a part of this whole experiment of life that we're in a little less seriously. And if we can use it in that way, then it softens the whole thing. And it's not about, oh, we're bad. It's about like, this whole thing is kind of a joke, right? like, yeah. this is bizarre, weird. Yeah. And, and there's so much to laugh at versus what's wrong with, what's wrong with me for being so ridiculous? Like, what's your deal yo it's right. less sarcasm and less uh, yeah i don't know pointed and it's it's hard it, it's just a hard thing to uh, oh last time i said that we got remixed <laughs> not saying that again. um <laughs> just we did in the best way we did we got completely remixed and it was hilarious um yeah. So I, I think there's that fine line and just maybe being aware of it. There's no answer here, of course, like in many instances, no. there's no answer. Just being aware that like, well, when are you going over the line where now you're actually making fun of yourself as opposed to let me see the humor in what I thought as opposed mm -hmm. to let me make fun of myself by making jokes about who I am yeah. or declaring that thought to mean I'm broken. So let me make fun of being broken. And I've seen that and it's, it's heartbreaking. So sometimes the humor gets used as a weapon. It's so true. And, and I do think that that mindfulness piece of just taking a step back and witnessing yourself instead of uh, making it about you as a person, I, I, I know that, and I, I'll share this because as we round this out, but I, I laugh now at some of my obsessions in particular, my obsessions around relapse with alcoholism, right? Because I spent two years of my life trying to, f trying to figure out whether or not I'd relapse by eating a piece of tiramisu, right? Like this was my life and this is my reality. And, and honestly it is, it's, it's sort of like, Whoa, I really, I really took that and, and went with it, you know, and th that is humorous to me now. And I think it, to your point earlier, wasn't humorous to me at the time, but I can really, and, and that, injecting that humor into my reflection on that mm -hmm. in this very, not, it was horrifying and terrifying. And I have so much like respect for myself in trying to navigate that. And if I can look back and inject a little humor into that moment, I'm more able to inject humor into these present moments where it might be more challenging. Yeah, which is great. And then you can look back at the process that you went through as somewhat ridiculous and humorous, not that you were ridiculous. That's that's the, that's the difference right there. Totally just nailed it. That's that's the the difference is the process is funny, uh, not I'm funny or I'm a joke or I'm stupid. Which are some of the same principles you find with with guilt or regret. You can regret what you did without actually passing judgment about who you are. So this, yes. this is a whole different discussion, but anyway, yeah. see, we were worried maybe like, next we're, time, maybe next time. That's what we're going to talk about. We're, we're 20 well. minutes without even batting an eyelash. So <laughs> I, like, I'm very self-aware of the fact that I don't feel I was very funny during this episode. And I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to accept that discomfort of like, Oh wow, this is about humor and people may be expected to laugh more. Uh, but you know, whatever, it's fine. Yeah, sometimes it's you just some days you're meta and some days you're not. Today we're not. That's okay. That happens. That's right. I like it. Anyway. All right, folks. Thanks for coming by as always. Always good to have you. We'll do it again next month. We seem to do these every month. We're going to be really good at that. So if you are not aware of who Lauren is or following her, then there you go. It's right on the screen. Follow her on Instagram at The Obsessive Mind. So yeah, that's how you get and, to Lauren. And then if you'll pull yours up, you're sure. Doing get all the tools. Remember, follow Drew. Because he's awesome. The dot anxious dot truth. That's it's very serious. Funny. There's lots of periods in there. The period anxious. I know. Because there's already somebody that, that has it with periods. And that guy got really popular in the last two years. Really? Yeah. It's a he has it's an anxiety account of some kind. So if you guys want to go follow the anxious truth without periods, he'll wonder why. But he's gotten quite a few <laughs> accidentally. 
Yeah. Okay. So. Um, sure. He's a good guy. So go follow him. Anyway, yeah. thanks for coming by. We'll see you guys again next month. And if you have comments or questions, send them out. Let us know what else you want us to talk about. And we'll do that. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Later. Let's end the recording.